Welcome to 2020, everybody. Happy New Year, everyone. New Year. Happy New Decade. This is, yeah, we are in a new decade. Yeah. I'm looking for stuff that's missing off my desk, and I'm apparently blind because I don't see it. It's not important. Um, there is a pin. I was looking for a pin. Um, okay. Welcome to the new decade. It is an exciting moment, I think, in gaming, because if you look at the MMORPG industry for the 2010 to 2020 bracket, eh, kind of a lame decade, I think. Um, there were Whoa. some good things. Yeah, because 2010, it's kind of far behind. Yeah, because even... still high. What was... Because, uh, like, Star Wars The Old Republic launched in 2011... Um, yeah. World of Warcraft but, peaked in 2012, I think was the peak for World of Warcraft. Um, I think it's it's at the beginning of 2010 when uh, Wrath of the Lich King came out yeah, with some, the patch of the Lich King. Somewhere in there was like the, the 10 million or 12 million yeah. subscribers mark that they had. They um, did it again, but after they had China too, so I don't know if it's... And it's not exactly the same. Count. So I, <laughs> I I believe that Wrath of the Lich King is the peak of World of Warcraft. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I mean we're we're now entering into a new decade, and I know um, I think for me as a, as a gaming kind of enthusiast as a whole, I really think that the 2010s for me personally, I saw the most innovation in the console space, especially with the PlayStation 4. Mm. Um, I, yeah. I think PS4 developers really did some interesting things. We saw the rise of PlayStation Live, PlayStation Now, Xbox Live, Nintendo's live service. Um, we, we saw just basically consoles begin to go from just being something that you could play single player to being online Games exactly. more so With than some memory PG that right. you have on console now, which is really really new, and more and more are coming to console. When did Destiny One launch? Um, two thousand ten. Nah, it can't really be that know. far ago. I'm gonna go look now. Destiny One, because I think I could think you know there were games like you know the Halo series that were you know on, in Call of Duty. These were online games. Um. Destiny it's launched funny. 2014. It's funny to do you're talking about that because during those Christmas holidays or during those holidays, I got my PlayStation back. I had give it to uh, the boyfriend of my daughter for a while. And so I got it back and I actually played PlayStation. I first played PlayStation um, with my boyfriend through internet, but then he came, spent some time here, and so we had two PlayStation next to each other with two screen, <laughs> and it was very fun. And I realized how much what they're doing on on console is probably uh, inspiring a memory PG, especially in the matchmaking system, and also s s certain way of of doing daily reward and stuff like that. Uh, because I played games that are not at all my style of game usually. So what did you like, play? I, I need I need insight. World of Warship Legends. I've never even heard of that. Um, it's it's a game where you have boats from the World War Two, mm -hmm. and it's a kind of strategic naval games, and you're just having to shoot other boats from the op opposite team. So it's okay. like PvP but with boat, and you're launching torpedoes and yeah, firing your cannon, and I was be playing with big battleship and stuff. I was the Japanese um, cruising. So played with Japanese ship only exclusively. I think the well, PS4 <laughs> has really come a long way. Um, and I think, especially if you look at, I think games that, in, in, in the yesterday, like think PlayStation 1, PlayStation 2, um, there was a lot of adult-oriented games as opposed to like Nintendo the original mm. Nintendo, which had a lot of children's games. And, yeah. and now that we're in the PS4 and like the Switch, I think the Switch in particular has a ton of family-friendly games. And then, but but I think, because since my brother has a four-year-old, my, my four, -year -old, four and a half-year-old nephew, um, the Lego games that they're doing, which are, they have all these themed Lego games. You know, there's, there's Harry Potter Lego mm -hmm. games, there's Lord of the Rings Lego games, there's Star Wars, there's, you know, all these different things. Um, those games are really fun. They're incredibly 
especially the, the more modern ones, more recent ones, because the technology has gotten better and they're able to make the puzzles more complex. And the fact that you can play, you know, together as a family, I think that that's something, whereas previous generations of PlayStation games focused more on just the multiplayer element, um, mm-hmm. as, you know, kind of playing with everybody around the world, um, we're seeing more and more family games start to become developed. And I think that's, I don't have children, but I think that's a really cool thing when I go visit family members and I can sit down with my nephew and play things with him. And, you know, even they're even challenging for me as an adult. And I know that they're challenging for him as well. And it's like, I can, I can think about, you know, what that's doing for problem solving and how that's helping him kind of develop that side of his brain. So he's only four um like he's the only kid in his class who can who can read he can actually read and all the other four-year-olds can't read yet Mm -hmm. um he they just finished my brother has been reading him the hobbit every night before bed it took him six months to get through the hobbit um but he got through the hobbit um and then like we sat down over christmas i like he got totally star wars out um over the holidays and um we he had gotten a like a little tie fighter um star wars lego set and it was for like kids four to six or something like that he put it together all by himself and we just kind of sat there and my brother and i just sat there and kind of watched him and and you know we had to kind of give him a couple of tips no hands on it was just like hey is that the way it looks in the picture and he'd look at the picture and turn it mm-hmm. around and be like, oh no nice. and then we were talking about like there are other kids that we've interacted with who are other family members and friends who have children who are like six and seven years old and can't even put together a Lego set on their own. And here's our little four. He's barely even four. I don't think he's four and a half. I think he's just like getting close to four and a half. And he's able to do this all on his own. He can read books on his own, small stuff. He understands and comprehends The Hobbit. Like they're doing he's Narnia. Continuous. <laughs> yeah, they're doing Narnia now. He's a very smart kid. Um mm-hmm. And it was just, I think there's a lot to be said for um, games being created for kids now and for families that ha- I think there's a lot to be said for that on, on the, on the opposite side of the spectrum of, from people who say that video games are bad for kids. I think there is something to be said for letting your kids play all day, but yeah. if, you're, if you're doing focused sessions, you know, an hour or two here and there, I don't think it's a bad thing and it can actually be very good for development. I, I agree very much with that. And then again, it's, how it's always kids? the fault of. The parenting and not the project itself. If you let your kids play, if you give up and you use your computers or your PlayStation, whatever, as a babysitter, of <laughs> course it's not yeah. going to be yeah. good. It's the same in my generation where it was the television babysitting kids. Yeah, uh, and and that's you still know, uh, that that is a flip side because I've seen I've seen multiple family members with children like mom's cooking and she's like I'm, i can't deal with you right now here's my phone here's here's moana go watch moana uh, you know or some disney movie you know and and by the way you know, moana was a great movie i actually sat and watched it with my two-year-old niece um was an awesome disney film uh but there is something to be said for parents yeah. still do that to some degree but i think if it's limited that's fine um yeah, so exactly. I... It's it, it, it's everything. It's not the project which is the cause. And I agree that video games have so many different things to bring to someone. First, you have the dexterity, how to learn your reflex, yes. your reflection, um, or, or you have all this 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 team of uh, just getting your hand on. And I think that even just the fact that you need to manipulate on a keyboard or on a controller and you need to, you know, uh, have a certain way of um, having your mind processing the virtual space together with hand movement on on stuff, on key binds and, and things. It's already something, a good gymnastic for the brain. Then you have the escapism part, which allow you to dream, to live in fantasy world in a more active way than the television where you just swallow what you served. But there you are more creative because you are handling your characters. You can do what you want. And then you have the social aspect, of course. So if it's well controlled by parents or well guided by parents to their children or their teenager or as adults, because it's not because <laughs> we're adult and responsible of ourselves that we're not doing bullshit far from it. Um, but then you will manage in to be healthy and to have the video games actually providing you goods rather than being another addiction. 
Yeah, I think there's a lot to be said. They definitely can be addictive. Um, mm-hmm. Actually, so this I mean, this is going to tie into, I know before the show we said we were going to talk about what we did over the holidays, and, and we will get to that <laughs> in a roundabout way. Um, so my brother um, had not gotten into World of Warcraft Classic yet because he was he got the new house built and he was trying to get internet installed there and just, you know, one thing led to another and he just kept putting it off. And he finally got his internet installed at the house, I think like on the 11th or 12th of December while we were there. And he started playing World of Warcraft and his, my, my sister-in-law immediately was like, you better not be getting addicted to this again. Cause I guess when they first got married before they had kids, <laughs> when they, when they just got married, they didn't have kids. My brother's life existed of, Work Warcraft, and then you know newlywed a, stuff. A bit of that, sleep. New, just, just the, yeah, the stuff that newlyweds do. Um, <laughs> but he would, and I guess when he was in college, even though he had classes and everything, he would play. I've I've never been like this, but I guess he was one of those. He he would play until he would pass out at his keyboard, and and I've never done that. Like I've I've as much as I love MMORPGs, I've never actually fallen asleep on my keyboard. So my sister-in-law was like threatening me, like, don't you let him, you know, you don't, <laughs> don't get him addicted again. And I was like, no, nah, he's got kids now. He's fine. And he does. He, he, he gets up and plays like an hour in the morning with his coffee before the kids wake up. And then if he's got time at night, you know, he'll come in and, he, and he's, he's having fun and stuff. But I, there is something there. Some people can get more addicted to it than other people. Yeah. Um, to that, I will jump into discussion and I will branch out a little bit from video game. But I think it's nice, especially at the new year, there's a lot of people that are resolute to not drink anymore, to not smoke anymore, to be more responsible with video game, whatever. I still am Addiction. drinking, but on a side <laughs> note, I am drinking coffee today because we haven't had a chance to go to the grocery store and get my wine. That's the only reason I don't have wine today. So I have water. You have water? <laughs> I had coffee because we haven't slept much in the last two days. Anyway, go go on, go forth. Yes. Addiction. I've seen an extremely interesting episode, uh, um, interesting videos about addiction. Um, where it was saying that we all have addiction, all of us. Uh, addiction, addiction is a way of coping from injuries, from trauma that are, you know, sure. in childhood or whatever. And instead of blaming the addiction that we all have, there's only some addiction that look very bad, like being a alcoholic, or someone that is addicted to meditation. No one will tell him anything because, oh, you're meditating, this is cool. But it can still be an addiction. And the addiction is just, I am so wounded that I need to compensate to save myself with whatever yeah and each addiction will be different and will be a response to different type of trauma so if you're meditating it's probably because you're really not happy with your life and you need to calm down or you need to find some insights but it can be very similar to someone which is escaping through marijuana for instance so we, we need to be extremely um mindful of this and also kind and compassionate towards people that have addiction, not judging them, whatever it is. If it's heroin, if it's uh, uh, sex, porno, whatever, it doesn't matter if it looks dirty in your mind. An addiction is the coping mechanism someone wounded. And only compassion can treat this. And the person that is addicted will have to do a travel within himself um, to to heal those wounds. And it's the same for video games so if you are addicted it's not the fault of blizzard or video games or because they are tricking you with dailies it's because you are have something to compensate and it doesn't matter what it is and it's not it's nothing to be ashamed of there's something to be said for um escapism as a coping mechanism i'll be the first to admit that there have been times in my past when, especially when I was younger, when I first got into gaming, it was definitely, you know, I didn't like growing up on a farm. I never liked Mm. working construction. So this is, you know, it just, that's what I kind of, that's the lifestyle I was born into. And that's the lifestyle I, I, for better or for worse, you know, whether it was forced upon me or whether I just didn't try hard enough to break out, there was a good, you know, chunk of my life of my early life where I was doing something that I really didn't like for a living 
And so I definitely used EverQuest as a coping mechanism when I would come home from work. It was mm-hmm. my chance to, you know what, I can now, I'm home, I can do what I really want to do. And that also led to, you know, I had marathon sessions on the weekends. You know, I'd play for my, my favorite memory. <laughs> so one that stuck with me is is chain pulling mobs outside of Carnor's Castle for 19 hours straight to get through level 45, which was the hell level in EverQuest 1. And that memory has stuck with me to this day because it was like, if I didn't do it in one session, it was going to take like four sessions to get through level 45. So I just was like, you know what? I've got, it was like a three-day weekend type scenario where I was like, I've got three days. I'm just going to do this and then sleep for two days and then go back to work. Um, so there is something to be said for escapism. Um, since we're coming back from the holidays, obviously we didn't do any episodes for a few weeks because mm-hmm. um, I went away and went up to the northern parts of the world to visit family for the holidays. Um, what did you do for the holidays? And then I'll catch up with what I did for the holidays. Mm, I have not done a lot of things. Uh, I'm not someone that celebrates Christmas, um, not because I'm not Christian. And first, I find Jesus very cool, so I will not mind to celebrate his birthday. Um, but the the reason it's that I, I don't know, I got disconnected from the Christmas holiday. I had a lot of shitty Christmas. I had a lot of very nice Christmas too, obviously. Um, but I never get back because of this. I never got back into the Christmas spirit sure. unless I was in Norway because that's very traditional. And I had more this feeling of observing family shattered that family communing together mm. so for me christmas has been more about to underline how the family or the christmas spirit was like all over the place and therefore i have uh, it's several years i'm not celebrating christmas anymore the two years before i have been doing a live stream during christmas to you know uplift people that are like me not celebrating christmas and maybe some of them are pretty sad and depressed and uh this year i've not done that because i had my boyfriend coming so we um we, we played playstation you did, you did other stuff <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this was I've just been pl- playing PlayStation, and that was it. So. This was uh, so my wife and I traditionally do not celebrate either, for different reasons. Mostly because we're kind of of the mindset. I think there's it, it's a festive time of year, and I think there's something fun about that tradition. But I think neither one of us really buy into that whole commercial aspect of you know buy everybody gifts. Yeah. However, this year was the exception because. Um, we Chris and I have been together for nine, ten years now. Um, I think going on ten years this year actually. Um, cool. And I might be off by a year. I might be going on nine years. Either way, um, we've never had a Christmas like la- right right before we moved here, like three years ago. We finally, you know, I convinced her. I was like, let me just get a little fake tree to put on my desk, and I put some lights around my my monitor. But that was as far as it went. Like we've never done gifts or anything like that. Mm. Um, but this year, I started talking with the family back around July, specifically my my sister, and I was like, hey, you know, if you can you come out, you know, um, and bring your kids and bring your husband and we get together with my brother and his kids and my mom and dad because we haven't really had a, you know, a fan. They, they do stuff. Um, but like my sister hadn't come out to see my parents for like three years, I think. And so there's just this thing. So I basically spent all summer organizing this big get together. Um, mm-hmm. And then because it's all my nieces and nephews and they've never really had a chance to get to know me and Chris. Um, we've visited a couple of times, but they're kids, you know, they're, they, they're young. So I use this opportunity as a, I'm going to spoil everyone rotten by just going cool. crazy with, you know, getting everybody Star Wars toys and, you know, all sorts of fun stuff. Um, so we did that. Um, and it was, it was fun. Um, we went up for the, for the whole month and it, it was freezing cold. There was an ice storm over there. I got some really good pictures, but like my mom does this thing where um, she'll bake like 500, 600 cookies um and just like all these different kinds of cookies and they give them to like all the neighbors and like the veterinarian pictures <laughs> yeah so you saw the pictures yeah so on facebook yeah so um like that was my wife's first time baking like she doesn't bake so my sister-in-law bakes and my mom bakes so chris was able to be involved in that process and and get a chance to experience like this 
you know, Christmas traditions that, that some people have. But I, I yeah. will jump back to something you said because one of the things that I had forgotten because it had been so long since, since I had done a Christmas celebration was the whole this is the time of year when everybody's together. So suddenly it's like you have certain people in the family who no matter what, they want to talk politics, they want to talk religion, they want to talk. And it's just like, I'm just like, oh my God, this is, I don't want to talk about these things. I just want to have fun and open presents and eat cookies. And by the way, I, I totally didn't work out while I was gone. I gained four kilos and I just went to the gym this morning. It, it was totally worth it though. Like I ate so many cookies and bacon and cheese, eggnog. <laughs> like I went crazy it for a month. It. it was worth it's it. It was worth it for the month. Yeah. But, exactly. but the, like that was the one thing I'd forgotten about Christmas is that oftentimes when you have all the family members together, people will start to debate things. And I, I literally, there was a, um, you know, no matter your point of view, there are certain topics that some people just don't want to discuss or debate. And I have a few of those. And one, for example, I, I just refuse to debate gun control with, with people who, who are big, um, advocates of needing to have automatic weapons. Like I have to have an automatic weapon because it's my right. And we have, I have family members that are like that. So was, there was just some some moments where there were some awkward moments of like, I'm just going to go get some coffee. Like I don't want to argue with people yeah. about guns. I don't want to argue about Trump. I don't want to argue about, you know, the, the wall and the Mexicans because Chris is Mexican and I don't want to argue about immigration and I don't want to, I don't want to talk about those things. I just want to yeah. eat cookies, drink eggnog, get fat and open presents. So I think if you, <laughs> if you can actively avoid those scenarios and I think we did a pretty good job um, it was also, I will say, it was the first time I've got to hang out with my sister in a very long time. Um, we went and visited them, uh, I think, two summers ago, but it was a very quick, like, two-day thing. So I lived with my sister years ago, um, and my sister and I used to be a little a little crazy. And um, I brought a bottle of tequila up from, from Mexico, and my, my sister and I, my... <laughs> <laughs> my sister-in-law we kind of just between the three of us kind of trashed a bottle of tequila and nice. played cards against humanity which is this horribly depraved and perverted game which is hilarious oh, yeah. but um we had a good time it was a really good holiday season um i got my brother jedi fallen order so he was able to go crazy with star wars stuff and then um watched a bunch of disney movies and Finish the Mandalorian. It, you know, it was, a, it was a good holiday season. It was it was a chance also to kind of disconnect from gaming for a month, which is something I haven't done in a very long time. Yeah. I still played a little bit of Warcraft with the community while I was up there. But um, for the most part, I think I only played like half the sessions that I normally play. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the time was just spent, you know, I had a, I got a two-year-old. She's not even two years old yet, but a, like an almost two-year-old niece and a four-year-old nephew. So there was just a lot of doing stuff with them and, and, like we also, so they have a cattle ranch. So we, we did all the photography for their branding and vaccination day. Um, and just, you know, it was a chance to spend time with family. So and, yours, yours and was we'll PlayStation basis. I will jump on this to say that it's sometimes it's indeed nice to take break from gaming. Sure. And this is how I realized that I was not addicted to video games anymore or to internet because, well, that's the extension of video games, well, you know, community, social media, all that stuff. I'm definitely not. I'm, I'm definitely addicted to the internet. <laughs> and, and this is when I got away from it and actually was my stream, was my whatever, what I'm doing is non-internet stuff. I'm like, there is a lot of fun stuff. So I actually, I've not read the Lord of the Rings in probably 15, since the movies came out. So it's been a long time. And I actually, I, at least I did read the Fellowship of the Ring while I was there. That's the first time I've read a physical book in at least, it's got to be since at least like 2006, 2007, since I've read a physical book. Because that's when I, I sold all my books in 2007 when I left to travel full time. And I've done some digital books since then, but it was it was nice to you know have a book in my hand and actually do that again. But I will say that the first 10 days at my brother's house, he didn't have internet at the house yet. So I was relying on my sister-in-law's hotspot. That was a little stressful. <laughs> and that's <laughs> that's when I realized that whether or not I'm gaming, I definitely like have a, have a connection addiction because I was like, and, and I will, in my defense, um, 
there were still business things that needed to be taken care of. You know, I was discussing things with a lawyer and we have the art team working on art stuff and I got to be in communication with Bobby and on the programming side of things. So, so there's a lot of moving parts in, in the building of Saga of Leucemia. So there is that aspect, but you know, I can get away with checking emails once a day in an emergency scenario, which that's what that was for 10 days. But there was definitely like this gnawing feeling like this, just like this, something's like chewing at the back of my brain, like, like this yeah. nervous, like you're not connected, like some, you know, Maybe I'm a little bit arrogant saying I'm not addicted to the internet anymore. It was not exactly what I meant. Uh, what I meant was my social building sure. up activities, things. But no, I will definitely be bad because a lot of the things I do is watching video on YouTube. Yes. So there was things like... <laughs> There's always internet because you don't realize it's only when you don't have internet anymore. So then you feel, oh, but I'm strange in this weird world and I'm cut off from everything else. I don't have What's Google happening? Maps. I'm gonna, I'm, I am can't survive without Google Yay! Maps. I want to check this. I know I cannot check it anymore. No, because, you can't. Uh, so I was actually showing my wife... Um, we did like three hours of watching videos on the, the it's called the society, the society for creative anachronism with the SCA. It's a reenactment mm -hmm. group in the United States. Um, they, it's not LARPing. It's not LARPing. It's, it's not quite that it's instead, it's a reenactment group that they reenact the middle ages um, without all the disease and pestilence and everything else. And mm -hmm. you know, that they, they literally have the United States is divided up into kingdoms and, and they have uh, counties and they have, counts and dukes and etc and and you take on a persona when you join and your your local group might have a get together every tuesday and thursday or every saturday at like the local park or they might rent a space and you'll go and you'll practice fencing or sword craft or you'll make leather goods or sew clothing mm -hmm. brew ale make food you know but it's all done using medieval methods and i was showing my wife these things and i was explaining it back when i was like 16 17 18 like 16 through 20 you know, it was a good four-year period of my time, you know, before before the internet had become this huge thing where you were constantly connected. Um, and that's what I did in my spare time was I did that. Like, it, outside of reading and work, I would go participate in these things a few times per week. And then they have big events once in a while. Um, and I used to do a lot of concerts, like go to, mus uh, go to musical concerts. I used to go to the movies all the time. Um, there's a lot of things that... And I, and I used to read a lot of books. There's just a lot of things that I don't do anymore because Netflix and gaming have, you know, <laughs> have become, yeah. you know, the I the used to go, used to go visit my friend without adverting them. No phone call, no nothing. I was oh, just wow. ringing their bell and say, hi, hello. I never, I, I would never do that. I at least would give oh, them a phone yeah. call. And be like, well, well, of course, I, my, my friends were more in the hippie kind of, style sure. people so they might be more open to things than other but I, I if i recall well whatever style you were you were open to that kind of things and it was something um frequent to just ring the bell to someone and see if it was up to do something at home and yeah i, I wonder if that's that just lot. because the way my upbringing was you know we were we were so remote because i grew up on a farm that that never really happened and then when i was out on my own you know, I can't think of any scenario where I would just show up at someone's house. I definitely always called to make sure that someone was going to be there before I made the trip. Um, yeah, this may be also because you were in far away. I, I grew up in Brussels, so in a city where yeah, you have, you know, bus, metro. Uh, yeah, that's. Bar, I think that's a little like different. That. I think when you're in a city, it's, yeah. it's easier to just be like, you know, you're 15 minutes away from your friend's house. Whereas I was always at least a 30 to 45 minute drive away from yeah, someone's exactly. house. So. Yeah, of course. It's completely different. Um, and that's just the environment. Yeah, I was, you know, just, oh, is this friend there? Oh, no, it's not there. I'm but go to the next we have door. that friend two, two weeks, two, two streets away. So let's go see that friend. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> All right, well, let's but. let's talk about a little bit of gaming. Um, I had asked some questions in Discord, and I, and I asked people to put for some questions. Um, we're going to save some stuff for upcoming episodes but there was one question from adric um which i felt was really cool and i'm gonna bring it up right now on my phone he had asked dun, dun, dun. he says i'm curious from your perspective if there has been anything about making an mmorpg that has been surprisingly undocumented or lacking in best practices for what should be at this point 
a decently established genre. Um, that might sound a little confusing the way he worded that. Um, so basically he's just, uh, to reiterate, he's asking, are there any things that you would think need to be better documented in the creation of MRPGs? Because it is an industry now that's been 20 years in the making, and yet we seem to have almost no information on how to build an MMORPG. So um, I can definitely speak to a lot of things, um, and you might have some things from your perspective as well, um, Willowa. But um, I know off the top of my head, and I, we were talking about this before the show, the one thing I think that, that stands out to me more than anything else, and I don't know how much of it is just because people don't want to publish this information because it's considered super secret and you don't want the competition to know. Um, but there is a lot to be said for um, the lack of information on marketing and community management of MMORPGs. Specifically, you know, and the benefit that I have coming into this is, is I spent 10 years in the marketing industry in the travel space, which is not the video game space, but it is very similar in the sense that there's trade shows and social media and media publications and journalism, you know, and all these different aspects to it. Um, so one of the things that really stuck out to me when I started, you know, kind of researching, you know, how do we market an MMORPG? There's some very generic information out there, but then there's just a lot of nothing. Um, and so the one thing that, that was in my mind was, well, whether or not, you know, conventions and conferences are worth it. Because in the travel space, going to a conference or a trade show um, as a participant is always an educational experience. And having been a speaker at 20-some events, going as a speaker is definitely a benefit to the brand that you are representing because you're going to get free publicity from being a speaker or, you know, even if it's so, it doesn't matter if you're sing, a single speaker or a guest panelist, um, being there to represent a company or your own brand brings visibility to that. Cause you've, you know, you've got anywhere from 75 to a couple hundred people in the room. And if you're doing a keynote, there might be a few hundred people, um, to a thousand people in the room. Um, and that's all eyes on you. And if they like what you have to say, then that's eyes on your product. Um, so I wondered, you know, how that translated over to the the gaming space, and there just wasn't a lot of information. Maybe there's more now. I haven't looked in probably two years now, but I remember when we were really digging into things, there just wasn't a lot of information. So I have the benefit is of of being where we are now is that we've been able to make enough of our name for ourselves that I was able to get past the door and speak to some people. Um, who have been in the industry for 30 years and, and kind of confirm what I had suspected, which is that, you know, unless you are a triple a company, like let's say naughty dog, um, who's willing to spend $150,000 to a quarter million dollars on a booth at E3, you know, unless you're that type of a company spending money to buy a booth at a conference, um, is a, risky scenario because you're not necessarily always going to translate passerbys into sales because the issue with conferences is that the companies who spend all the money get all the visibility and if your team only you know so in that scenario if you have a triple a company who could spend a quarter million dollars and they have all of exhibit hall a and they've got you know a giant flat screen you mm -hmm. know movie theater size thing and they've got 50 stations set up for people to play their game and they've got people running around in cosplay costumes and everything else, you know, that's going to draw all the eyes onto that project. And if you're this little, you know, four man team over in the corner with your little $5,000 booth, that's way over there in the back where nobody's paying attention because everyone's over there because that's where the cosplay girls are and that's where the big screen TV is and that's where all the mm -hmm. explosions are happening and everything else. Like the chances of you getting any visibility back there are almost nil. And that you have to look at that and say, well, is it worth me spending five, six thousand dollars for the table, you know, a few thousand dollars for plane tickets to send my team members there, you know, a couple thousand dollars on accommodations and food. You know, by the end of the day you might spend fifteen thousand dollars to send your team to a convention and that's on the cheap 
side of things. And then if you want to do like a decent sized booth at like GamesCon, you're looking at a $50,000 investment. So when you start to look at that, it's like, unless you have a big enough marketing budget to throw 50 to $75,000 at, you know, putting together a presence at a conference, it's kind of not worth it to spend your marketing budget on conferences and trade shows to, in terms of publicity. Because unless you're able to spend that fifty to seventy-five thousand dollar minimum, it's you're not going to be able to make enough of an impact for people to even know that you exist. You might get ten people that come by your table, but if you're back there in the corner when everybody else is over there, you're just not going to get any visibility. So I think that that was one thing that was very refreshing that I was able to get from people on a first-hand, face-to-face basis that I just couldn't find any information about that on the internet. And I kind of knew that that was that way from the travel industry because it's very much the same thing in the travel space. Unless you can afford to spend $50,000 and be the big guy at the convention, if, if you're just the little guy in a corner, you know, I've done 30 trade shows, I think, somewhere around there over the years. And I've been through shows where it's like, you can you can see the ones that aren't going to make any money because it's like it's these two sad looking people sitting behind a desk somewhere in the corner. Mm. Nobody's mm. coming by to look at their flyers. No one's asking any questions from them because they're just they're back there, you know. And meanwhile, over here, woo! I hand- still wonder if there will not be an interest into doing that um, if, when you have enough money, of course. But it, w- what you need to have, it's at the big convention like Gamescon or TwitchCon or whatever convention it is. And you're a small person. Uh, you, you, you can, you know, um, make it look bigger and nicer because a lot of people are not putting the effort into it. And even with, with um, you know, little handcraft and whatever, you can make it nice. Or naked lady, almost naked ladies that cosplay. Yeah, cos- just the, rent the, two of them. <laughs> no, I'm not. But no. It's it's funny, but also not funny, in that as much as people talk about how they don't, that they're against sexism, and that they're against it's still this, work, right? it. Everyone does it because sex sells, and yeah. honestly, the cosplay industry as it exists today would not exist if it weren't for beautiful busty women wearing skimpy costumes yeah. yes yeah. yes <laughs> if, if they weren't making those kind of costumes and doing what they're doing in the space we wouldn't have cosplays that exists today of course and that's not i'm not being sexist i'm not being you know machismo i'm not being a pervert by saying that it's just fact like it's just yeah i agree with that people and like to look at beautiful women and and beautiful men as a beautiful well. Beautiful guy, but... right? Beautiful guy too. Because it, it, anyway, it's kick ass. You know, you see a big guy with a big armor, and you're like, "Hey, what? What game what's is he? That? What's he was... represent? You know? Yeah. What? Just who is that? Yeah, his armor is so cool. So okay, so you have your stand, a very small one with all your decoration. You try to make it look nice and professional, and you know, you just need to be a little bit tasteful and not just take your backyard uh, tent with just yes. some stickers and stuff. So, so you, if you make it nice with with not money, and you have computers. You, you, you need, need to have a few computers running. You also game. need to have swag to hand out because people like yeah. stuff. That's true. But mostly the, 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 the computers because all the other games, you know the famous one that you can't compete with because they're big? Well, you have also a very big competing queue. And mm-hmm. then you will have the people that are like, oh, no, I don't want to wait one hour to try this game. Let's see what there is. Oh, that little stand here. What is this? Oh, there's almost no queue. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's something to be said. Like I said, my my overall analysis there is is more of a generalist stance. There are definitely things you can do to make noise, even if you're a small mm-hmm. person without a lot of yeah. money. But that's one of those spaces where I, I just found that there wasn't a lot of information. And no, there's the no, other I've one never too um, was uh, in, in the same vein. You know, we were starting to look at how much is it is it going to cost us to go to conventions, and it took us a long time. There are actually um, a couple of really good resources out there where these there's a couple of small independent teams who basically just put together a budget 
and they showed exactly what they spent on getting everything together and going to do conferences and 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 do publicity for the game and i felt that that was for me you know it took me a long time to find the right information because there's a lot of just crap stuff out there but i finally found a couple of really good resources where i was able to go through and i'm like oh cool they, they actually itemized you know storage units and the cost of a rental trailer and you know the cost of renting monitors versus buying monitors and and all this stuff and they had broken it down into an itemized list with like you know a good 75 80 things on the list you know things like you wouldn't think about like you're going to need power cables and usb cables and you know all of these things that people aren't going to think about and by the end of the day they might only be five to ten dollars per but when you add up 20 cables suddenly you've got two hundred dollars in cables and you know and so when they broke that down i was like okay so now i can actually go in and say it's going to cost x to y to send our team to places that was a very useful resource um i think the other one too um is there is no information on and this might because this might just be because of the complexity to build an MMORPG Hmm. Uh, because it's not something that is as simple as a two-man or three-man team building a 2d scroller you know for the switch like an MMORPG takes eight years you know conservatively and it takes a team of anywhere from 15 to 30 people on the small end up to teams of 50 to 150 on the big end. And I think that there's just so much variance in the types of structures that no one has really defined, you know, what is the best way to do it? Cause there really is no best way because what works for one company is not going to work for another so it's really hard to find any information about, well, you know, obviously I can understand project management and that helps. Um, and I can understand marketing and that helps. And I can understand team management and that helps. But at the end of the day, it's like, I can tell you one area where, where we have definitely struggled over the years, which is the lack of, um, like for example, um, Figuring out what's going to be the best back-end structure for your game. Like, what's the best networking solution to build an MMORPG? That information is, like, almost nothing exists. Mm, Or there didn't when we first started. And that's why we had to go in and figure it out. And then, you know, we did consulting. And we definitely consulted with people. But even that wasn't enough to get us the information that we needed to be able to just do it. So we had to just, you know, we used third-party solutions for the first four years basically until we decided that we were going to build it all from scratch last year and that's what bobby's been working on behind the scenes is just kind of building everything up on our own and that was because we didn't have any engineering experience when we jumped into this we had programming experience we had artists we had music composition we had writers we had all of these things but we didn't have the engineering experience and there Mm -hmm. was no information out there and when we went to try to ask questions of other industry veterans it's like they don't want to tell you because it's like secret sauce it's like well Mm -hmm. you know we can't you know because they had to build their own from scratch and because that's all nda and and etc you know they don't want to talk about that stuff um i will say that um you know once we were able to get to the austin game conference and kind of make a bit of a name for ourselves the conversations got a bit easier at that point because we had then gotten the visibility of being on stage and people were taking us a little bit serious more seriously at Mm -hmm. that point yeah um so it's not just like a band of two friends that say yay i have this saturday ied that we will do an rpg sure and Mm -hmm. i'd say i would say the other thing too is um that conference in particular like you know we paid for everybody who went you know the company paid for them to go i mean it was an educational experience for us um there was one talk in particular that i felt paid for the entire conference it paid for everybody's tickets everybody's plane tickets it paid for the airbnb it paid for the entire cost of our team to go um there was a talk by uh what is his name i think jack emeritt he's the ceo of daybreak now but he built you know he was the he was behind cryptic studios so they did star trek online and i think a, a dc universe or some some superhero game um, he did a talk, and I can't remember who else it was with, 
um, but they did a talk on working with publishers. And up until that point, we had not found any reliable information on the internet about, you know, what does a, you know, we'd found a lot of, you know, kind of talk about this is, you know, kind of what a publisher developer agreement looks like and, and some of some very generic stuff. But these guys did like an hour long talk where they had spreadsheets and spreadsheets and spreadsheets and more spreadsheets and they had broken down like every single variable in the negotiation process and showed it from both sides of the table so it was like this is what you need to be looking at as a publisher and this is what you need to be looking at as, as a developer and there needs to be a little give and take on both sides but then you know this is why this costs this and this is why this percentage needs to be this and like I remember it was I think it was me and John who went to that one and we were both sitting there like just taking pictures and notes it was like this particular section this one uh, talk in particular was worth its weight in gold because it was information that we'd been searching for that we hadn't been able to find and it was it really helped us then figure out you know pub, uh, going with a publisher was probably not going to be a good solution to us for us because um we weren't willing to give away uh the ip like our ip is everything to us like owning the brand and owning saga of leukemia I'm very much in the George Lucas camp on this of like, I want to keep the merchandise. I want to keep the rights and everything because, you know, as this continues to grow, owning all of those different income streams allows us as an independent company to kind of have a lot more flexibility to do what we want to do and have, have the leverage, so to speak. Whereas the moment you sign away your rights to, the publisher, no. you are now their bitch, essentially, and you have to do what they tell you. And it's like, yeah, yeah, it's, I'm not willing to do that. When it's your creation, where you put your soul into it, you cannot sell that. No, I mean, and there's there's something to be said for, you know, partnerships where everybody wins. And you definitely, you know, if you need a partner, um, there is a reason why, you know, if someone's going to give you a few million dollars, then you have to be willing to give them something in return. And I'm okay with revenue shares and, you know, things of that nature. But what I'm not, I'm yeah. not for is creative control. I'm not, I'm not going to do any sort of um, partnership where I have to give up uh, creative control of my company because this has been my baby since I was 19 years old. So it's, it's, yeah. it's definitely, you know, I want to make you sure that sell. I can control the, the future of this. So that, that, that was one thing. Um, there was just no, in, no good information out there on the publisher and developer relationships. And he, he was not the only person. There's a guy behind, um, like he's a, a Latino guy. I'm really blanking on his name now. He's he's the head of the company. I'm gonna look this up now. Um, the company that published Banner Saga, which is called Versus Evil. That's the name of the company. It's the, the, the guy behind Versus Evil, Steve Escalante. Um, he gave another brilliant talk on the publisher from the publisher side of things because they are a they are a publisher. Um, and so listening to him talk about the publishing side of things and how the developer fits in there gave me a much better understanding of where we fit into the industry and, and what our leverage would be if we ever needed to go to the table and work with a publisher. So those two talks in particular, um, those were two, two subjects kind of, you know, about publishing that I was naive about because we'd never, we've never done this before. So yeah, as, as even though we had a, even though we had a working game by the Austin game conference, which is the end of 2017, we didn't have any working knowledge of how the publishing industry worked. I had an idea because I'd worked with the book publishing industry in the travel space. So I kind of knew how publishing worked in general, but you know, obviously there are nuances to the gaming industry that are different than that. Have, have you ever done any work for um, any multi, uh, um, I am blanking on the phrase now. Have you ever joined a partnership on YouTube where you were creating content for a company and they were paying you like a multi channel, type deal no. okay no. like a partnership i guess i should say like i know those exist in the in the in the youtube space as well where you know you eventually get big enough where you sign a contract with say twitch or youtube and it's like a two-year contract and and for those two years you're creating content exclusively for them um 
I know. No, I'm I'm partner. It was other schools and and are in it, but but you could do those on your own terms. It's it's, it's not the you know you, you have a sort of contract to sign up, but it's very lenient, you know. Sure. <laughs> it just uh, what well, makes sense. <laughs> I think. Um, I mean, that's such a big topic. That that whole conversation of you know what are some of the things. Um, some stuff is really well documented, like um, especially when it comes to how to work with an engine, um, how to work with Unity, or how to work with Unreal. There are so many, t- like literally myself, my brother, John. You know, everybody at the beginning of this, before you came along, Ella. I mean, back in 2014, you know, 2014 was literally all about learning how to use Unity, and that was literally a, a mixture of Lynda.com subscriptions, uh, YouTube videos, and uh, what is it, Udemy, I think, or Udemy as well. I mean, there's there's all these different places where you can go watch tutorials. Like, I literally, um, just because we hadn't found anybody, you know, we've been looking since the beginning of 2019, and we hadn't found anybody who was who had, who had provided us with a resume that was up to snuff that we were looking for, but we were, we'd been looking for a VFX person for a long time because it's an area where we're lacking, and... Um, we just weren't finding anybody. So I think it was October when I said, you know what, I'm just going to go dive in and take some tutorials and just figure out how to do VFX. And that sounds very simplistic and very naive. And it, it definitely is because, you know, I'm never, I've not spent five years or 10 years doing VFX, but I think people can, it, when people come in and log into the game, it's, you know, cause I know the alpha testers have seen it. Um, and when mm-hmm. we get to the vertical slice in April, people will be able to see it as well. But, you know, the last release we did, we only had like four or five effects because we just kind of cobbled some stuff together from some packs. And now we've got, I, I want to say, over 20. I, I don't know the exact number, but I, I believe we have over 20 VFX now um, that I was able to get into the game between October and November, basically two months. And I was able to do that by literally just following along YouTube and Udemy tutorials and and just learning how to do some very basic VFS stuff. So when it comes to like VFX and even programming um, to a basic level, I mean, very, very basic level programming, um, but any art stuff, any VFX stuff, that's all going to be, excuse me, very well documented for any of these free engines that you can use. Um, you're gonna use SpeedTree. There's, gonna, there's tons of tutorials out there on how to use SpeedTree. Um, any sort of software that you're going to be using, um, you know, whether it's uh, ZBrush or Maya or mm-hmm. Blender or whatever, there are tutorials at the Wazoo for all of this stuff. But the thing is, just because you can make art and just because you could make VFX and just because you can, you know, model or sculpt or something does not mean that you can build an MMORPG. So I'd say if there was one thing I think that's lacking in a in totality which i think comes back to that complexity issue is that there is no documentation on how to build an mmorpg um and those of the followers who have been around for a long time you know i stated i said this back when we first started the project like everybody on our team has had a mandate from the beginning of this project to save every single thing they do even if it's on a scrap of napkin paper because i and that's also why we've always shared all of our youtube videos because they aren't they aren't there for marketing purposes. They're there as documentation to show how we built an MMORPG from scratch with no previous experience. And my goal is that by the time we launch this game, we will have, you know, seven, eight years of YouTube videos to go back through and be able to actually walk people through step by step and say, this is how we did it. It's not the only way to do it. But this is how we were able to build an MMORPG from scratch. Here's some things we learned along the way. Here's some things we do differently. Um, Because there is no information out there on how to take VFX and art and music and networking code and programming code and all this other stuff and, and make it all work. It's literally having a team who works well together. And that in and of itself is a pain in the ass to make happen because... You know, at least from my perspective, I've always been more interested in people who wanted to work on this project as opposed to people who only wanted a paycheck because we came into this without investors and without 
a name. So in the beginning, we didn't have anything to offer anybody. So I had to find people who wanted to build an MMORPG and share in that journey and shared the same passion that I had. And that's tricky because you're asking people to make a seven to eight year commitment and potentially not make any money until the game goes live, you know, and that's, that's a hard sell for people who need to make money. Um, but I would much rather have somebody on the team who's passionate about it as opposed to someone who's just going to be there to draw a paycheck. Um, because at the end of the day, and I've made some comments in the past in my diary of indie game dev series, you know, there are, you know, what I call minimum wage clock punchers, you know, they're just salary monkeys who just want to make a paycheck and everybody needs money, obviously, but. And you cannot, you cannot do a job like this. I think a video game, a MMORPG or whatever it is, art in general, if you're not passionate by it, because it requires much more than what you can expect to do this sure. job. It's not just a task. You need to put your soul into it. So you're not really willing to put your soul into it or a part of it. This um, is this is this also comes back to this is why I don't I don't buy into the whole controversy behind quote unquote crunch with AAA games where people are complaining about being overworked. Because if you're working on a AAA game, AAA salaries People make really good money making AAA games. I have friends who work in the AAA space. And when you're making $125,000, $125, $125,000 a year on the low end, and you're making video games for a living, like, seriously, you're going to complain if you have to work some extra hours at work? Like, I, you know, this is something I want to do. And if it's something that you love doing and you're passionate about doing, there's that old saying that, if you love what you do, it's never going to feel like work. That exactly. is, it's absolutely true. So if you don't love it and you're getting an exceptionally good paycheck, then that's your problem. That's not the industry's problem because you're being well compensated for your time. Whereas, you know, we have, uh, you know, a, a bunch of people who would love to be making $125,000 a year salaries. And, but we're still plugging away because we love what we're doing and we're passionate about the project. So, yeah, the one thing I think I could take away was there's just there's not enough information on there uh, out there about how to how to actually build an MMORPG. And you would think that there would be because we've been in this industry for 20 years. There's been hundreds of MMORPGs built. You know, there is even though they're all different, there are some very formulaic components to this. Like you need you need a couple of programmers to do this. You need an engineer to build a back end. You need a music composer to do this and the music the music composer needs to be thinking about these things because you know there are certain elements of you know music composition and pacing and you know all of this stuff and then there's the vfx and there's it's not just about having spell effects it's about you know it's about forecasting with yeah. spell <clears throat> effects and you know show you know if it's an ice spell it needs to look and feel like an ice spell and there's just so many components to this. Everything making all that come also together. in the MMORPG are linked to each other. Because I think that the most challenging aspect of an MMORPG, well, there's two. There is the technical aspect or the stability of the server. Because you need to have that many people joining on your server through all places of the world on, you know, like medium computers. And the social aspect or the, you know, the psychological aspect of MMORPG to incentive players to enjoy your game, which is probably extremely different from just a one-shot game because you, you offer a good story with the intrigue or whatever, good gameplay, it's enough. But in MMORPG, you need to keep the players. They need to continue to play. So those two aspects, I think, are the more challenging. The everything which is the story, the art, the composer, the you know the gameplay. If you have good concept, I think it's it's fine enough. Of course, you could be an idiot and do it really wrong, but I think that's the e not the easy part, but the most the easiest part. But the technical things and the social aspect. So if you're failing your concepts to make play people, players to want to continue to play your game. And if you're having unstable, laggy servers where you have bugs all the time, that's turn off players. 
immediately. And so you need to think, oh, yeah, the spell effect is very beautiful and it sounds nice and it's well animated, but damn it, it's making like the server. Yeah, and I, or I so can't we cannot have it. That was actually the very first thing we did um, for people who can go back to our very first login in 2015. We had we had lag like visually there was lag because we didn't have animation and then we had packet loss that was happening and the animation sequences weren't tied up so people were rubber banding across the across the scene but nobody got disconnected um, that's that's always been our I would say it's probably been our number one focus since we started this project was making sure that our network connectivity is you know the number one that's that's the most important thing because it is an, a massively multiplayer online game so you need to make sure that people are not getting disconnected you need to make sure that they're able to you know log into your game play the game um then after that comes performance um mm -hmm. and and after performance comes visuals uh, actually after performance excuse me comes you know is the game fun the gameplay loop is it a yeah. fun loop etc and after that comes visuals and unfortunately many players of today's variety will look at a game and make a judgment call based on what it looks like which is unfortunately it's not a good it, there is no indication based on the graphics of a game of whether it's going to be a good game or a fun game because there are many games out there which look like crap but are very fun to play and there are also many games out there that look amazing, but are crap games to play. Um, and yeah, and it's, it's 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 one of those things where you have to make sure that you have the fundamental, fundamentals in place. With an MMO, it's got to be network stability, which, by the way, that was going back to that, there was not a lot of information out there, so we just had to kind of figure that all out for ourselves. Um, after network stability is, um, you know, just making sure that you've got performance that's another another area where there's not a lot of information out there in terms of how to how to tweak a game like how to get like if you're a graphics programmer more efficient, right yes. if you're a graphics programmer that's your day job and i know exactly why there's not a lot of information out there about this kind of stuff it's because you don't you don't uh there's a saying and i gotta remember i gotta remember the saying now um why sell you know why sell the whole cow when you can just sell the milk um, and if I'm the person who owns the cow, I don't want to sell you the cow. I just want to sell you the milk because then you keep yeah. coming back. The moment I sell you the cow, you no longer need me. So from a programmer standpoint or a graphics engineer standpoint, there are certain things that you don't want to give away to the general public because that keeps you in a day job that keeps mm -hmm. people needing you. So there are aspects of game optimization that you're never going to find out there in the, in the game world. And I understand that and I appreciate that because you know, that kind of information needs to be protected. Um, but there definitely is some lacking in like optimization areas. Um, so do you mean that if you're publishing your whole documentary uh, video series about how to build the perfect MMORPG that you will get assassinated and your house will be burned? <laughs> it's a possibility. <laughs> no, um, I don't think that would happen. Um, I also don't, you know, nobody knows where I live, so... Um, oh yeah, good plan. <laughs> yeah, well, for now, you know, don't, you don't ever want to get to keep that this. Size. You need to keep this information secret. Secret, yeah. Well, no, yeah, especially. Yeah, I have a green screen, so no one will know where you live by the, you know, the time of the day and the, the angle of the light on the wall and the texture of well, the. And unfortunately, curtain. you know, there are trolls out there who, you know, dox your house and and do really stupid stuff. So. Um, I, I know some streamers that had really yeah. big trouble with people trying very hard to follow them and finding the area of living just by analyzing the, the lake in the background. Oh, that's of horrible. On it's, so, it's really scary. Like th that's one of the yeah. reasons like we, you know, we have friends who, um, who don't let their kids be on social media. Like they won't let, they won't let anybody put pictures of their kids on social media mm -hmm. because they have this, this, whether it's a valid fear or not, um, there is this, you know, kind of thought process that we shouldn't necessarily be putting everything out there because some stuff, some stuff should be private. And my place of where I live 
should definitely be private. Like no one needs to know where I live except for my friends and family. Like if you're some random internet dude who just wants to, you know, shoot at my house because you don't like the patch that I put into the game. Exactly. There's something wrong with you. Like there's a so there is a serious psychological issue with you as an individual um, that you want to go to that length and like find out where I live by analyzing the lake you know, through the window of my home when the sun is at four o'clock and you can see, you know, the position of the tree. Like that, that's just, that's weird. That's, that's psychological. Yeah. But this happens. <laughs> yeah. so, so on that note, just, um, I can't think of anything else up to, I mean, I could obviously continue talking about many, many aspects. Yeah. But um, I think we have done a long episode. Yeah. We've, already. we've, we're um, over an hour right now. So I uh, know there was another question, which I think we will lead into, uh, next episode. Next episode, which is spoilers. Yeah, spoiler alert. Hang on, I think it was in the other Discord, so I got to go over to the other Discord now. Uh, I gotta find it now. Do you remember what it was? Another one. Uh, yes, it was about the limited action bar oh, in yeah. video um, games. Yeah, so that's what we're talking about next week. Do not miss it. Yeah, don't miss it. Infinite um, action bar or limited action yeah, bar? We'll be discussing. What do you prefer? Pros and cons, and what we're doing with Saga of Lucemia, and obviously taking questions from the community on what you like. So thanks everyone for following along. Um, appreciate all your subs and everything else. Don't forget to subscribe and follow along. It is the new year, so hopefully you guys enjoy what we've got coming to you in 2020. Stay tuned. we got really cool stuff in the yeah, future for Saga of Lucemia as well. Um, big reveal coming up in April, so we'll be talking more about that on the show as well as over on various Twitch channels, etc. So stay tuned for all that. Until next time. Yes, and a happy new year still. Happy new year, everybody. Take care. Stay safe.